大家来到财新辩论。Welcome everyone to the 财新 debate Davos 2022. We have a full house, and I believe there is a line outside the door as well. So we are very fortunate to welcome all of you and our speakers into this very important session. The year 2022 is eventful for any country, China included.、Uh, in China, it started with the Winter Olympics in Beijing, and then、uh, in spring there is COVID flare-up and lockdowns, and then later this year we have the relaxation and reopening, and deadly flooding summer, a reminder of more frequent extreme weather and the importance of climate change actions and the effort of Go Green. And the 20 Party Congress in October, charting out China's blueprint in politics, economy, and society, pledging continuous reform and opening up. And I'm sure you read the number、uh, this week that China, for the first time in 60 years, have the reduction of、um, population, and also the GDP number is three.、Uh, it's challenging, but within expectations. So, with all this together, 2022. Will be a very unforgettable.、Uh, uh, some some year we will remember. But the most important question is not just about what shaped our 2022, but really what's lying ahead. Hence, our panel today, China's next chapter. I'll introduce our five distinguished guests with ex- enormous insights and experience on China. Starting from my right-hand side. President and CEO of Asia Society, Kevin Rudd, who needs little introduction. He's a former Prime Minister of Australia, and in March will be the Ambassador of Australia to US. A decade-long China expert, fluent Mandarin speaker, known to many Chinese as Lao Lu. Yeah. Well, I'm alive. And、uh, Wang Jieming, the Vice Chairman of State-Owned Asset Supervision. And Administration Commission, which we call SASAC, and then、uh, Nicholas Aguzin, CEO of Hong Kong Exchange and Clearing, Gucho. That's right. Very welcome. And Jen Sun, CEO of Trip.com, the leading online travel agency. I'm sure many of you book your travel to Davos through Trip.com. So welcome, Jen, as well. And last but certainly not least, Marcos Trujillo. President of New Development Bank and also economist, former Deputy Economy Minister of Brazil. But、let me s- quickly start from Kevin. You first came to China in 1984, yeah, and came to the country numerous times since. When was the last? Well, when, now with the China's reopening, when do you think is your next trip to China? And a more serious note, what do you see a more open, vibrant Chinese economy mean to the world? Well, it's good to be back with our friends from Taishin, and it's great to have this forum here at Davos and all of our Chinese friends back again. And um, and uh, all I can say is, after three years, China, we've missed you. And it's good to have you back. Uh, and uh, it's uh, good that we're in contact with each other again.、Uh, it's been hard, as you know, to travel to China during that period. Yeah, I've been in and out of China hundred, hundred and fifty times over the years. I've lived and worked there, and、uh, I do love the place. <clears throat> But it's three years since I've been there. So your question is, when am I going back?、Um, Uh, maybe、uh, before I take up、uh, the new position in、uh, Washington, That's、uh, uh, maybe next month. I've got to do、uh, an Asia Society event in、uh, in Hong Kong, and so I may、uh, flip up to Beijing. We'll see how that turns out. What does it all mean?、Mm. I think、um, none of us in the world have had an easy time with COVID. Nobody. That's just the truth.、Um, And、uh, everybody has struggled, in particular, with how to、uh, handle this massively contagious variant called Omicron.、Um, so,、uh, during China's struggles during 2022, I think the world has watched with、uh, concern how China has handled this, the sudden nature of the decision on December the 7th to go 180 degrees from zero COVID to completely open. And observing、uh, the impact in terms of the massive infection rates, which is predictable, but also our concern as human beings for the impact <coughs> on old people, which we've seen in our own countries, which we've seen in our own countries. So, at a human level,、uh, we have a, a real sort of feeling for what the Chinese people have gone through and what old people are now going through. For the economy,、um, then China obviously had no choice. 
Uh, zero COVID was uh, not working for China's growth numbers. Uh, the 2022 growth numbers uh, were at best 3%, possibly less. And we do expect now a bounce back. The official numbers are probably around 5. We've seen the provincial numbers being projected around 5. I think this will be uh, turbocharged by consumer demand. Uh, as uh, Gucho and I were discussing just before coming on, you've got something like a couple of trillion dollars worth of extraordinary savings by Chinese consumers accumulated over the last couple of years, and I assume they want to go to Jane's place and find a travel <laughs> option for themselves. And so, um, but that will be writ large in Chinese domestic consumption and, frankly, international private consumption. So I'm expecting a solid growth number for, um, for uh, 2023. That'll be good for China. Importantly, in a world where growth will be challenged, with Europe uh, facing recessionary uh, challenges, the United States question mark in terms of how soft or hard the landing will be, and the rest of the world, uh, in the developing world, struggling. If China produces a solid growth number for 2023, five or five plus, that will actually underpin mm. much global growth uh, for the year to come. Thank you, thank you, Kevin. And let me flip the question for Mr. Wong. What you think the uh, post-COVID high-quality opening of China might mean for Chinese economy and Chinese companies? So, Wong Zhiren, do you think the high-quality opening of China, that is, the post-COVID high-quality opening of China, will mean for Chinese economy and Chinese companies? Hello, everyone. We still think the high-quality opening of China will mean for Chinese economy and Chinese 呃，肯定是好的，但我认为呢，不仅是对于中国的经济，而且呢，对于世界的经济也是一个利好。我呢，差不多是三年多以前到过欧洲，在这个过程当中，我认为呢，中国向世界开放的大门是一直敞开的，我们的疫情政策呢，也是根据。保证人民群众的安全这样一个角度呢，不断的与时俱进，当然也是根据相应的情况发生变化以后，我们做了不断的优化。下一步呢，应该说随着呢我们政策的全面落地，生产、生活相应的秩序不断的正常，那么呢？我们就可以跟更多的外国朋友呢进行线下的交流。当然，呃，我其实也要表达一个意思，即便是在疫情期间，我们呢还是可以通过许许多的方式呢跟外国朋友进行交流的。中国的央企在一百八十个国家和地区都有相应的项目，这些项目呢在双方的共同努力下，都还是有条不紊的来推进。呃，下一步呢？我们认为呢，通过我们之间的不断的交流，一定够能够，呃，不仅呢是对于，呃，全球的经济好，对于呢，呃，中国的经济和企业呢，也一定是好的。好呢，具体可以表现在几个方面吧，有利于我们中外的企业共同打造全球的稳定的供应链，也有利于呢。我们共同的研发高水平的技术，也有利于我们共同来不断的打造或者是完善公平公正的秩序。当然，也有利于呢我们共同的借助中国的呃超大规模的市场，实现呢企业之间的互利共赢。当然，开放一定是双向的，中国。必然是大力度的推进高水平的开放，但是呢，我们也希望，在这个过程当中，国家和国家之间一定是对等的，只有对等，只有共同全方位的开放，才能够呢，促使我们这样一种合作能够不断的稳定，也能够实现互利。谢谢。Thank you, thank you. Uh, he mentioned about supply chain, innovation, reciprocity. Some of the points will come back in our later discussion. Um, I want to turn to the far right to uh, Marcos. Uh, when we talk about uh, China's economy recovery is so important to the world, 
Some want a speedy recovery, some want a more long-lasting, slower-paced recovery that's more sustainable. For either scenarios, what do you see are the key areas for China to focus to overcome the obstacles? Well, Li, once again, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Sai Xing, for putting this together. Uh, Li, perhaps the single most important obstacle uh, for China is the temptation to shy away from globalization. And this is something that China should avoid and that I think China will avoid. The most dramatic example of economic rise we've had over the past 40 plus years has been that of China. And China accomplished that by engaging more with the world, by opening uh, its uh, borders, by keeping an intense flow of trade and investment. But now uh, globalization is, itself is uh, shifting. The way for recovery to be sustainable over time, as I see it, will take four uh, very important drivers in consideration. So the first one is, it is true, uh, 2022 and 2023 are very tough years, but there is one uh, certainty out there, is that emerging economies will have a bigger and bigger share of the global GDP pie. By the way, in 2022, if you take account the GDP numbers by uh, purchasing power parity terms, the E7 is already uh, about 20% 20, 20 bigger than the G7. The E7 being the seven biggest emerging economies of uh, the world. And you might think that is only uh, happening because of the relative size of China, but if you take China away from the equation of the emerging economies, the e and you take, of course, the United States out of the G7, the E6 is bigger than the G7. So doing more trade, doing more investment, being there for emerging economies is, is a way for recovery to be sustainable over time. Second thing, there's a new generation of trade agreements out there. It's no, no, no longer only about tariffs and quota, but it's also about standards, about parameters. China has to be there as, as a shaper of, of, of those trade agreements in uh, the future. Um, third driver, very important one, we're talking about a talent-intensive economy. The, the good thing about having borders open, more exchange with the rest of the world, is that these flows of talents can keep uh, pouring into China and vice versa. And fourth, of course, we're talking about a global economy in which we see more and more the marriage between physical and tech-intensive infrastructure, and China, and China can also lead the way in that particular regard, which once again will ensure uh, long-term uh, growth. In, in, in short, Li, I would take it that since this panel is titled The Next Chapter for China, so if, if China is an architect of the next chapter of globalization, instead of avoiding, the, and avoid therefore the temptation to shy away from it, uh, not only recover, but what sustained growth over time will be there. Thank you. Thank you, Marcos. And I want to also zoom into the market. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about the economy in general, which the market watches very closely. And I know the market has been anticipating the uh, post-COVID growth in China for a long while. So what's the sentiment now? Tell us the secrets beyond the indices that are showing us. Are people excited or still remain a little bit cautious? Yeah. yeah. Look at your please. Thank you. Thank you. And, and um, we all know that um, 2022 was, was, was a difficult year. And um, we just heard today the, about the growth rate of 3% last year. And um, the reality is that this post-COVID reopening of China is probably the most positive catalyst for global markets that there is in 2023. It's very significant. It was faster than most people expected. And it's, it came accompanied by um, a long list of policy initiatives. And um, Kevin and I were discussing some, some of the discussions that took place in the Central Economic Workforce Conference, which is took place in December and, and where it's um, a place where there's discussions about like key initiatives for 2023. And besides the fact uh, of having an active monetary policy, a very supportive fiscal policy, a focus around the areas that have been his a drag in the economy in 2022, like for example, the real estate sector and initiatives aimed at uh, really trying to 
resolve some of the issues in, in that area and, and facilitate increased activity for an area that is so important for the whole economy. And, and also um, the fact that a lot of the um, issues identified in, in the technology sector, platform companies, it's a process that took you know, a couple of years. They're coming to the end of it and there's a lot of positive messages around the resolution and the fact that there may be reactivation of those sectors. That combination of things together with international investor sentiment becoming more positive. And just to give you some indicators, since the beginning of uh, November, when the reopening was starting to be indicated, until today, the Hang Seng Index increased around 40%. The Hang Seng Tech Index, which tracks the new economy companies, increased 60%. And in just like the first you know, 10, 12 days of the year, we've seen more inflows, international inflows, through our Connect program into China than in the whole of 2022. So it's, 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 it's quite a, um, a remarkable turnaround. Now, when, when we add all this up and we combine it with the fact that, and we have some experience on, on a recovery, because remember that at the beginning of the pandemic, the first few months, when, when China suffered quite a bit, but eventually then the next year growth was over 8%. There was a quick rebound. Now this time over the last two years, there's about $2 trillion, as Kevin mentioned, that has been accumulated on excess savings. Chinese people typically save a lot, 20, 25% of their disposable income. Over the last two years, it got up to 35%. That's huge. That's about $2 trillion of money to, waiting to be spent. When all that comes together with all the other conditions, it should be a very encouraging environment for, for the market. So um, we're, we're, we're quite optimistic. We have to contrast that also with the fact that international outlook is a bit more subdued uh, in developed countries, developed economies. And with it, rates going up, I mean, the expectation is that there will be a slowdown. We'll have to see how this plays um, you know, between international developed markets and, and, and China and other Asian uh, developing economies that are also having very positive uh, results. Thank you. Thank you, Gucho. Let me turn to JN and see if the uh, private sector and the company's performance can really substantiate the, uh, um, the strong um, interest on the market and the capital market uh, rebound. Uh, what kind of political and economic measures you think Chinese private sector hopes to see and what can effectively shore up confidence among business leaders like you. Mm. Yeah, in the past three years, uh, as every country, travel was very difficult industry to be in uh, because in order to isolate the spread of the virus, pretty much the world uh, put a stop on the international travel. However, as soon as the policy is announced to open up the door, we have seen tremendous surge uh, in the travel demand. Uh, so, so far, for our domestic travel, we are already back to 2019 level or uh, even more. Uh, and for people travel from foreign to foreign. For example, people from London travel to New York, from New York to Tokyo, from Tokyo to Hong Kong. Uh, uh, these uh, areas, uh, we already seen uh, three digits uh, growth already. Uh, now, the most challenging piece is cross-border transactions. Uh, the demand is already there. Uh, we have seen three digits growth in search, in demand. However, uh, we are working very closely with our global partners, such as international airlines, uh, international airports, international hotels, to ramp up the capacity uh, so that we can bring more people from China to the rest of the world and from the rest of the world to China. Uh, in the past, uh, the cross-border transaction was reduced significantly. So uh, we love to uh, welcome more international friends to come back to China and uh, visit with us and conduct business activities uh, in many years to come. Thanks, Jen. So you can see a very rosy picture of the rebounding of the economy and the uh, enthusiasm from the private sector. But what are the headwinds? Turn to Kevin. Um, China relies on export, especially during COVID, first two years that the 
strong international demand pushed up Chinese economy. Now we are entering many of the advanced economies are facing risk of recession. What kind of external environment China's, Chinese economy is facing in 2023? I think in 2023, uh, China's going to face a combination of um, residual domestic headwinds, but also the international headwinds you just referred to. If we look, Guche just referred to the Central Economic Work Conference in uh, December, which we spend a lot of time analysing uh, in the um, Asia Society Policy Institute and compared it, for example, with the one 12 months before. So the changes there are quite dramatic, which I think point in a positive direction for Chinese growth. Uh, the platform economy, Ping Tai Jingji, uh, seems to be, um, uh, shall I say, uh, in a now less regulated phase. Uh, for the, uh, for the uh, property sector, you begin to see the evaporation or the reduction of the so-called three red lines. Yeah. So that's going to unleash some activity in property, some activity in the platform economy. Consumption we've just spoken about in terms of uh, savings. So these drivers will be strong. The one which the international community will be looking at carefully is what will happen with Chinese domestic private fixed capital investment and whether that will recover from the doldrums of recent years and whether private investors will have the confidence to invest in new plant and equipment for the future. So that's still a question mark. On the international headwinds, uh, as uh, we, uh, if you listen carefully to what Kristalina Georgieva and others are saying from the International Monetary Fund, uh, we are in the balance in terms of what the shape of the global economy will be in 2023. China's traditional reliance on net exports as a driver of growth uh, remains, but it will face a 2023 which will be export challenged, primarily driven out of Europe, partly out of the United States and some other markets. So it will not be as strong a driver for China's own domestic growth performance as perhaps some Chinese economic planners would want. The last factor is just geopolitics, and I'm sure we'll come to that later in um, our conversation. If uh, China and the United States can keep geopolitics within a certain equilibrium, um, then we should see reasonable growth. If we don't, then I think uh, that will also act as an external headwind. We can talk about that later. Exactly. If we start talking about geopolitics, we're going to consume the rest of our panel time. And but it is relevant to the economy, which is why it needs yes. a one-line reference. Of course. Uh, we'll come back to that later. And um, Marcos, Je um, Kevin mentioned about just now that export is challenging in 2023. And you indicated also that China needs to transit as the best example of success in export-oriented strategy switching to a more innovation-oriented strategy. So is innovation happening? Do you see that transition happening in 2023? Well, uh, when, so when the opening up policy was first implemented back in 1978, if you added everything that China exported to everything that China imported, that was only about 12% of China's GDP. China was one of the most insular countries in the world. So this goes up all the way to 2006, where the sum of exports and imports were 67% of GDP, 2022 down to 35%. So there is already a very structural transition in place from an export-oriented economy towards an innovation-oriented uh, economy. Of course, the overall numbers are still pretty big. Look at imports, for example, President Xi Jinping uh, during the Shai, uh, Shanghai uh, Export uh, Import Conference two years ago predicted that all the way from 2022 to 2032, China will import about $28 trillion. So China's growth and China's demand vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, I'm not only talking about export-oriented, but trade-based, will still be very strong. So the question is, will this transition mean more value addition to China? Now, one of the things that I like to look is, for example, when I started out working as a diplomat 32 years ago, we looked at the uh, overall level of uh, GDP investment in um, research, development, and innovation. So China accounted for about 0.6% of its GDP going to R&D. Now it's close to 2.5%, which is the average of the OECD. You look at the number of patents 
that China deposits every year at the uh, World Intellectual Property Organization. So there is indeed a transition towards uh, innovation. And it's not only uh, destructive creation, creative destruction, chimpanzee like innovation. It's also about frugal innovation that's taking place. So yes, I think this is this is happening. Once again, I go back to my to my initial point. If China remains open, if if China is there playing the role of an architect of globalization, so this transition will be will be made easier and uh, easier. Thank you, thank you, Marco. Um, Underneath the uh, uh, macroeconomy, the reviving of the service sector, that's uh, one example of the uh, consumption that we're talking about. Um, the momentum is there, but um, there are also a lot of um, uh, challenges, including that many, for example, for the uh, travel industry, quite a few companies went out of business already. There are people laid off during um, uh, the last three years. Are there signs of rebirth that uh, you can capture from the market uh, Jang, and also, what does that tell us about the overall economy? Mm. Yeah, in the past three years, uh, the travel industry has suffered a lot. Uh, so for airlines, airports, hotels, uh, many uh, part-time workers have been laid off. Uh, for Trip.com, we adhere to a principle that we always put customer first, uh, our partner second, and Trip.com the third. Uh, Customer first, during very difficult times three years ago, when COVID happened, uh, our customers were on the border trying to travel out. They already paid airlines for the fees, uh, but uh, all of a sudden they couldn't do it. So even before the airlines and hotels refund Trip.com, we already made a promise uh, to give 100% uh, refund to our customers. Uh, so altogether we refunded 20, million, uh, 20 billion uh, to our customers. Partner second, in order to preserve the ecosystem, uh, we also established a two billion uh, partnership fund to help our small partners uh, to with their cash flow. And Trip.com the third, our employees were suffering quite a lot. So our chairman and myself volunteered to our board. We will take zero salary. And our VP echoed, uh, they volunteered to take 50% of the pay cut. And our employees also uh, volunteered to work four days, stay at home for one day, work three days, stay at home three days. It is this, uh, we are all together, uh, weather the storm, uh, which help us to preserve our <coughs> talents and workforce. Uh, so now the border opens, we are able to uh, very quickly um, recover our workforce ability, uh, build up our capacity to host millions of customers who are ready to travel. Now the challenge is that uh, our partners also need to be very quickly rebuild their capacity. Uh, so this morning we are working with the airline partners, hotel partners, and airport partners to make make sure they have a plan uh, to recover maybe 30% in Q1, 60% in Q2, and by Q3, we hope uh, the capacity will be back to normal. Uh, so these are the challenges. We work very closely with government around the world, uh, with our partners around the world, and hopefully by the end of this year, we'll be back to normal. Thank you. And um, like Kevin just mentioned, the tech sector, especially the platform economies, um, have been uh, um, under a lot of pressure in the last two through three years. And of course, Hong Kong, we all know, is one of the favorite destinations of Chinese tech companies. So what is your feeling about their sentiment? What's your view on the Chinese tech sector moving forward, Gucho? Yeah, um, so the, the technology sector is, and innovation sector is, is, is moving full steam ahead. Um, especially as it relates to Hong Kong and, and a lot of the innovation taking place in, in, in the mainland. And, and we see this by the number of companies that on a regular basis you know, want to come to our market. We have 100 companies now lining up to go public. Uh, last year was, as I mentioned, a difficult year, but despite all that, there were 90 uh, companies that actually came and, and listed in the market. And if we look at the combination of Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong, about 70% of the capital raised in the world came from these three markets. And a lot of that was directed towards um, the innovation technology sectors. Um, since we changed our listing reforms in 2018, 
about 254 companies actually went public, raising almost a trillion Hong Kong dollars. So that's, you know, about 120, 130 billion US dollars, a very, very significant amount. And, and um, the, the technology sector, especially platform economy, that it's a sector that's been, you know, increasingly regulated around the world in the US, in Europe. China took some steps to regulate that sector. And, and a lot of the um, remediations that needed to be done has been, uh, for the most part, part, done. So we've seen some very encouraging and positive comments that we're getting, you know, to the end of the remediation uh, process, and therefore, a lot more optimism about companies um, being able to um, tap the international market, fundamentally the bigger um, uh, platform economies. So uh, we're, we're very optimistic. There are a lot of changes that we are actually doing uh, to our markets to make sure that we can continue attractive innovation. Uh, one of key initiative, um, and remember, this is a sector that has a ton of support from a policy point of view. In addition to that, we, we, we have a situation where you have something called the Greater Bay Area, some of you may, may know, which is essentially you know, part of southern China and Hong Kong. It's a region of about 87 million people with a GDP of close to $2 trillion. That is a little bit like, a, it's the second most significant innovation hub in the world. It's like having Silicon Valley together with <coughs> Wall Street almost all in one because you have Hong Kong and, and, and Shenzhen and all that innovation happening in, in one place is pretty remarkable. But what we're doing is we're also changing our, our rules, our, our listing regime to be able to attract companies that perhaps have no revenues, they may not have any uh, income, but they have significant spending on R&D. Companies in quantum computing, there may be in space technology, um, you know, artificial intelligence, areas that are very, very important, but, but they may not have the profitability or revenue to qualify for our main market. So what we're doing is like developing a new chapter that will be able to attract those companies. So when I look at um, technology, innovation, um, I, I echo what Marco said, China has the biggest patents today of any country around the world. I see a very vibrant sector and a lot of opportunities going forward. Thank you, thank you, Kucho. And uh, let me focus on the uh, major players of the uh, of the economy and uh, turn to one of the large players, that is SOEs. Um, uh, Mr. Wong, so in the Party Congress report, um, the Chinese Party Congress report, President Xi called on to build a stronger, better, and larger state-owned enterprises. In your view, you're running all those SOEs. What role do SOEs play in China's growth in 2023 and beyond? And what they need to do to become more competitive players in a leveling play field, both at home and abroad? So it's a man rang. 国企在中国经济发展是一个未来的经济发展里面起到一个什么样的作用当然了有的嘉宾也谈到了 就是2022年是中国呢经济比较困难的一年甚至呢觉得GDP增长3%是一个很不愿意看到的这么一个数字 同样在比较大的经济体之间进行比较，百分之三在我的印象当中基本上还是居于前列。当然，我也很高兴，我们有的先生呢，对中国的未来的发展充满信心。这一点呢，我可以这么说：英雄所见略同。我们呢，作为中
和国有企业，在二零二三年要能够发挥什么样的作用？未来呢，我们如何参与竞争？我们是这么看的：中央企业呢，在中国的经济板块当中。它居于比较特殊的位置。从发挥作用的角度，我们认为呢，第一个就是中央企业要为各种所有制的企业，为呢中国的一点六亿的经济单元市场主体呢，在基础保供，特别是。水电油气汛这个领域，做出呢相应的贡献。大家知道，任何一家企业、任何一个居民，如果要自我循环的话，他一定脱离不了水电油气汛。大家也都知道，除了石油之外，石油的价格。在中，在全中国呢，在全球可能处在一个平均的水平，但是水电气汛基本上处在全球的低水平，价格的低水平。我们说呢，质优而价廉。之所以形成这样的格局呢，就是我们的中央企业。是提供了相应的服务的。电，按人民币计算，我们呢，居民的始终保持在五毛钱左右，这在很多的国家不可想象。即便在去年，全球能源价格大幅度飙升，但是中国的企业和中国的。老百姓没有什么感觉，都觉得我们处在一个这方面的成本很低的水平，所以呢，中央企业将会在这方面做出重大的贡献，比如说电力，我们实际上是发挥的发电的比例呢是达到了百分之六十二，可想而知。我们所能做的工作，这是一点。第二点呢，那就是要推动经济的发展。我们中央企业的人均增加值，也就是全员劳动生产率，能够是呢市场的。平均水平的四倍，应该说还是处在一个比较好的增长。去年呢，中央企业营业收入达到了近四十万亿人民币，增幅呢是八点三。我们的利润总额呢，达到了二点五五五万亿，增幅呢是五点五。在二零二三年，我们的目标就是中央企业的利润一定要超过我们目前设定的 GDP 的增幅，而且希望能达到更好的水平，为呢整个中国经济的发展创造条件。实际上呢，也为跟。世界呢，各个方面的合作，创造条件。第三个呢，我们也要面对全世界的一种共识，通过投资，通过其他的带动，让我们的产业更多的朝呢，像本次会议的主题，新能源、新材料、人工智能、高端制造等等领域的发展，通过。这种导向，我们可以跟更多的外资企业
和民营企业呢，来加强这方面的合作，也通过我们的科技创新。刚才呢，呃，有的嘉宾也谈到了，科技创新将会成为我们下一步的整体的发展的一个重要的因素。第四个呢，就是要跟各类所有制的企业共同来发展，既可以从供应链的角度也好，同时呢，跟股权合作的角度也好，都是如此。要说呢，提高竞争力，提高竞争力是所有的企业。共同面临的问题，我们需要提升，其他的企业呢也要提升。中国的中央企业就是平等的市场主体，政府是没有给予特殊的政策的。我们希望，我们呢能够跟各类所有制的企业进一步的共同的同台竞技。具体呢，时间关系啊，我就点点提吧。第一个，我们要更加注重效率效益，提升我们的价值创造能力。第二个呢，要开启新一轮的国企改革的三年行动，使我们的企业更加具有活力，更加具有创造力。第三个呢，就是。更加注重科技研发，使我们的发展的动能更加有力。现在呢，中央企业、工业类的研发投入都已经是达到了营业收入的百分之三，科技类企业全部在百分之十以上。所以呢，下步要进一步的。要推进。再一个呢，我们就希望我们更多的和外资企业和民营企业来加强合作，取长补短。在这一过程当中，我们共同来收到全球发展，特别是中国发展的红利。谢谢。Thank you. That's a very uh, welcoming open message to all players. And now we are, have only three minutes left. And as promised, we will devote all that into geopolitics. Uh, Kevin, uh, you have one minute to talk about US-China competition. <laughs> and my question is more specific than that. Um, US restricts China's access to critical technology, chips manufacturing especially, and also lobbying allies and partners to cut Chinese tech firms out of their supply chains. If you were Chinese government, what, what should you, what you think China should respond to this? Well, these measures in the United States don't occur in a vacuum. I mean, it's part of a bigger picture. And the bigger picture is the uh, strategic competition between the United States and China, which has been under, underway now for at least five years. Uh, whether we choose to politically recognize it or not, that's just the reality. Um, and so uh, the challenge for geopolitics, and I'm mindful of the clock here, is can we find a stabilizing mechanism, given the reality of that competition, to prevent it from escalating into some future crisis, conflict or war? That's the essential challenge for us all. I think the encouraging thing coming out of the summit between President Biden and President Xi Jinping in Bali in November was to take some tentative steps in that direction. If you look carefully at the text of what the Americans said and what the Chinese said, there is a predisposition to try and put some guardrails around this relationship. Xi Jinping used terms like a, um, a, um, a new uh, Antren Wang, a new security safety net underneath the relationship, some new Fang Hu, some new protections around the relationship. So I think this is encouraging. Um, secondly, on the critical question of technology, and I'll conclude on this, um, China launched back in 2015 its determination to become uh, self-sufficient 
in 10 critical technologies. That's the China 2025 plan. If you look carefully at the Central Economic Work Conference report of December last year, its aspirations for national self-sufficiency in semiconductors, in uh, quantum computing and artificial intelligence, it remains China's policy. So these measures, by and large, predated the American reactions, which we've seen in recent times. I do not see, therefore, an ability to return the technology competition between the two states to a steady state until we resolve the underlying uh, geopolitical uh, stabilisation question. Otherwise, that competition will continue and it may go into new areas uh, such as quantum computing and artificial intelligence. In other words, there is a real risk that we will still face a high level of technological decoupling. Thank you, Kevin. And also, I'll turn to you, Marcos. You also have one minute to talk about the little question about supply chain challenges China is facing. So facing all the French shoring China plus one strategy, all this and that, what would be your advice for China to cope? Well, Lee, uh, I'm, I'm not there to say the geopolitics are not important in the way that uh, supply chains are being redrafted, but I think there is one structural change that's far more uh, impactful in redesigning uh, something that's actually bigger. We should talk about value networks and not only supply chain, which is, once again, the bigger and bigger chunk of global GDP that's going to the uh, uh, bigger uh, emerging economies. I'll, I'll give you an example of my country, for example, Brazil. Uh, back in 20, uh, 20, um, back in 2002, China-Brazil trade was a billion dollars a year. Today, it is a billion dollars every 60 hours, right? Uh, if you look at emerging economies, about uh, uh, two out of every three emerging economy country uh, has China as more of a trading partner than uh, the United States. So this creates a new web of collaborations that stand, extend beyond supply, that touch demands, that touch R&D flows, that touch the way in which uh, you organize your strategies. So there's a web of competition out there. And I, I think at the end of the day, more important than, than the geopolit geopolitical discourse, the uh, reallocation of uh, supply chains will be determined. The GPS, the most important GPS will be the balance sheet, right, where it makes sense to allocate your resources here and there. Thank you. We're definitely running out of time, but I want to have one last <coughs> word, not just from one person, but from everyone, that our topic today is China Next Chapter. So what would you, what, which word would you pick to describe China's next chapter? Start with Marcos, please. Um, evolution. Evolution. And Jen? Innovation. Innovation. Gucho? Vital. 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 Yeah. Mm. And, um, and, uh, Mujuan. Kaifa. Kaifa. I love that. <laughs> Extend and, and, uh, well, the final, final word, Kevin. If the, the, if we're asked for a word about China's next chapter, I would say still uncertain. There you go. Thank you. With that <laughs> optimism and also caution, please join me. Thank you, all our distinguished guests, for joining us today.